Iran is not mincing words. In fact, it has issued a fresh warning to Israel. The message is very clear and it has been delivered by the Iranian news agency through an infographic. It listed out Iran's many missiles that are capable of reaching Israel. Just look at where the two countries are on the map. This is Iran and this is Israel. The two countries are around 1.7 thousand kilometers away. Between them are Iraq and Jordan. Now, Iran claims it has not one, not two, but nine missiles that can reach Israel. And which are these missiles? One, Sejil. Its range is 2,000 to 2,500 kilometers. It has a speed of anywhere between 12 to, 15, 12 to 14 Mach. Two, Khorram Shahir. It has a range of uh, 2,000 kilometers. Khorram Shahir 4. Its speed is between 8 and 16 Mach. Three, Emad, its range of 2,000 kilometers, speed 7.2. Shahab 3, it has a range of 2,000 kilometers and a speed of Mach 7. 5 Qadr, its range is around 1.9 thousand kilometers and this missile travels at the speed of Mach 9. Here are the other missiles, Paveh, Khabashakan, Fatah 2 and Hajj Qasem. These are all Iranian made missiles. And by showing them off, Iran is basically sending out, a message, sending out a message to Israel. We are ready to, for war and we are capable of hitting you, Israel. And just note the timing as well. It comes after a drone strike in the Iranian consulate in Damascus. It happened last Monday. 11 people were killed. Among them were seven members of the IRGC, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. There were two senior commanders, including the commander responsible for overseeing the operation of the Quds Force in Lebanon and Syria. The Quds Force, by the way, is the IRGC's foreign relations arm. The commander in charge was a man named Mohammad Reza Zahedi. He became Iran's highest ranking official to be killed since the assassination of the Quds Force chief, Qasem Soleimani, in the year 2020. Iran has vowed to avenge the attack with its ambassador to Syria, saying that Iran's response to the strike would be, quote unquote, at the same magnitude and harshness. Iran's Joint Chief of Staff, Mohammad Bagheri, told a group of mourners that Iran will decide how and when to attack Israel. The time, type, plan of the operation will be decided by us in a way that makes Israel regret what it did. Obviously, Israel has not formally acknowledged its involvement in the drone strike. It has not issued a denial either. On Sunday, Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said that Israel is ready for quote-unquote any situation that may develop vis-a-vis -vis Iran. What kind of retaliation are we really looking at? Will there be a direct face-off or will Iran use its militia? You see, Iran very much has the option of using one of its proxies, the Hezbollah in Lebanon, for example, or the Houthis in Yemen. In fact, the Hezbollah leadership recently said, and I'm quoting here, be certain that the Iranian response regarding the issue of the Iranian consulate will inevitably come. The foolishness that was committed by Netanyahu concerning the attack on the Iranian consulate will open the door to resolution of this battle, quote unquote. Attacks at sea also have gone up since the Damascus drone strike on the 1st of April. The Houthis claim they have attacked two Israeli vessels that were heading into Israeli ports. The group also claims to have attacked a British ship. The U.S. Central Command claims to have shot down an unmanned aerial vehicle. Will the Iran-Israel face-off play out at sea or will it be land? This is the Yaya Rahim Safavi. He is one of the senior advisors to Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. And here's what he said over the weekend. The embassies of the Zionist regime are no longer safe. The question is, is Iran planning a tit-for-tat attack? Will Iran target Israeli embassies? Israel has temporarily closed 28 of its embassies around the world. An indirect face-off between Iran and Israel is something that the region has dreaded for a while now. Many West Asia watchers have been warning that the Damascus drone strike could have been that turning point that many could have seen coming, but no one really needed. So the big question here really is, what next? Are the Israeli preparations aimed at a possible war with Iran? And what happens 
if the two sides do go to war. Here's a rough comparison of the two militaries. The Israeli Defense Force has around 170,000 troops plus 465,000 reservists. Iran's IRGC has 230,000 troops plus 350,000 reservists. Israel is West Asia's most battle-hardened military, in fact, having fought many wars. But the IDF is currently spread thin in Gaza. Iranian troops also have combat experience. Having in the past gone to war with Iraq, Iran and Israel have been fighting proxy wars for years. But there has not been any direct confrontation yet. Is it now only a matter of time? I don't remember the last time we managed to get through a week without reporting on Boeing's faulty planes. It's just Monday and Boeing is back to 9 p.m. news with mid-air mishaps. Things are coming apart once again. It began with a plug door, then a tire, a part of the fuselage, then disappeared mid-air. And now we have an engine carving coming off. It fell off a Boeing 737 plane during takeoff. What is an engine cowling first? It is the part that covers the plane's engine. On the 7th of April, the engine cowling of a Southwest flight came apart mid-air. It collided with the wing flap of the aircraft. The moment was captured by some terrified passengers aboard. Take a look. Uh, fly present heading, do you need to run a checklist? Yeah, we're going to need some time. It, it, for, for now, everything's okay. Uh, and we don't even know the nature of it, but apparently uh, several passengers and flight attendants heard something loud hit the wing, so we're just going to take our time, get set up, and be ready to go. Thank you. That was 3695, no problem. You can expect back In fact, reports quoted a passenger as saying, People in the exit row started yelling at the flight attendants and showing them the damage. We turned around and made a full speed landing. Southwest flight 3695 left Denver International Airport at 7.49 a.m. local time. It was supposed to head to Houston. There were 135 passengers and six crew members on board. The plane had climbed to about 10,300 feet. It had to turn around and return to Denver 25 minutes after taking off. After the plane made an emergency landing, it had to be towed to the gate. America's Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA, is now investigating the incident. What has Southwest said? The airline said it would review the jet, adding that it was responsible for the maintenance of such parts. Sure, but the big question here is, why do incidents like these keep happening to Boeing planes? The American plane maker started the year with a mid-air scare. On the 5th of January, a door panel blew out mid-air. It was a new 737 MAX plane operated by Alaska Airlines. When the incident happened, the plane was cruising at 16,000 feet. no one was injured. Concerns increased. United Alaska found loose parts on 737 MAX planes. Inspections were conducted in India as well. Parts were found missing from Boeing 737 MAX planes. Airlines like Alaska and United also reported concerns. Few weeks ago, the CEO, Dave Calhoun, then announced he would be stepping down by the year end. In his letter, Boeing CEO Calhoun called the Alaska Airlines 1282 accident a quote-unquote watershed moment for Boeing, adding that we must continue to respond to this accident with humility and complete transparency. We also must inculcate a total commitment to safety and quality at every level of our company. Just last week, we learned that Boeing paid $160 million to Alaska Air as compensation for the losses that the airline suffered as a result of the grounding of the fleet. We also learned that earlier this year, Boeing's outgoing CEO gave up a $2.8 million bonus on the heels of the Alaska Air incident. But to what end? I mean, while these financial compensation sacrifices may seem generous to some, how is either of that guaranteeing passenger safety? It's not. My point here is very simple. This is a story about passenger safety.
every week we are forced to come face to face with the safety problem with Boeing planes. Every day, millions of people fly Boeing planes. At any moment, at this very moment, some 500,000 people are estimated to be in the air on a plane. Many are flying Boeing planes. Where is the guarantee that these passengers are safe? No one was injured in the Southwest incident, thankfully. It was a closed shave, much like the other Boeing disasters this year. In March, a tire of a Boeing plane fell off mid-air. There were 235 passengers, 10 flight attendants, four pilots on board the United Airlines plane flying from San Francisco to Osaka. The plane was forced to make an emergency landing. In March, a Boeing 787 plane operated by Latam Airlines suddenly dropped mid-air. 13 had to be rushed to the hospital after the plane made an emergency landing. And later that month, a cabin panel fell off a Boeing plane. There were 139 passengers on board. So far, luck has been favoring passengers on board Boeing scarecraft. But what's the guarantee? That streak will continue unbroken. Things have been turbulent for Boeing. Since 2018-19, that's when two back-to-back -back crashes involving Boeing 737 MAX jets killed 346 people. All MAX jets were grounded globally. They managed to take off again after 18 long months. But nothing really changed on the ground. Is Israel's pullout from Gaza's Khan Yunus aimed at recuperation or restructuring? Just have a look at what Israel has been up to over the weekend. It closed its embassies in at least 28 countries around the world. Leave for combat units was cancelled. GPS navigation services were blocked. Air Defense Command was amplified. Bomb shelters were opened and more troops were placed at its borders. Clearly, something is brewing. What is all this in preparation of? America is confused. Washington does not know what Israel is up to. Israel says it is for rest and recuperation of its troops so they can be better prepared for future operations, including the planned Rafa offensive. But is it really meant for rest and recuperation? Or is there more to this than meets the eye? Perhaps a possible new front in the war? Let's just understand the possibilities of Israel's move. Possibility number one, Israel is speaking the truth. It has withdrawn its 98th division to prepare for future missions. Announcing its decision on Sunday, the IDF said that its 98th division had concluded its mission in Khan Yunus. The forces are exiting and preparing for their next missions. But then just how many Israeli troops have been pulled out remains unclear. Earlier on Sunday, the IDF army vehicles were seen heading to one of its bases in southern Israel. Apparently, they have left just one brigade there. The one brigade, named Nahal, remains in central Gaza, splitting the Palestinian strip in two and preventing the return of civilians from south to north of Gaza. You see, since the start of the year, the Israeli military has been reducing numbers in Gaza to relieve reservists. So this fits what Israel has been telling the world. But then by Sunday evening, the IDF chief of staff, Herzi Halevi, told a press conference that the military operation against Hamas is far from over, despite the withdrawal of soldiers. Which brings me to possibility number two. Israeli forces left southern Gaza to finally launch the Rafah offensive. We know that the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has insisted that the Rafah operation is imminent despite the international condemnation. This plan has drawn. Israel, in fact, has said an incursion into Rafah is important to achieve its goal of eliminating Hamas from Gaza. Israel says that four battalions of Hamas fighters are stationed in Rafah. 
On Sunday, the IDF Lieutenant General Herzi Halevi said that the military is far from stopping its operations in the Gaza Strip. Following the withdrawal, Israel is adamant about its Rafah plan despite America being dead set against it. You see, Rafah sits in the southernmost part of Gaza and has become a shelter for hundreds of thousands of displaced Palestinians. It had been designated as a safe zone for, for civilians, in fact, fleeing the widespread destruction in the densely inhabited areas further north. At least 1.7 million Palestinians have been displaced as a result of the war. The entire population is at risk of famine. Back in February, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, warned that an assault on Rafah would put the final nail in the coffin of humanitarian aid operations, leaving Gazans without support. And then last week, Israeli forces admitted to killing seven aid workers, calling it an operational error. The U.S. and other Western allies have repeatedly called on Israel not to launch an all-out attack on Rafah. It is the last remaining area that has not come under the control of the IDF. All signs indicate that Israel is preparing for the Rafah offensive. But these are obvious signs. Does it mean they are real enough or is it something Israel wants us to believe? Because if it was, if the... It, if it was us reading the tea leaves, we would say something else is brewing here altogether. Which brings me to possibility number three. Israel pulled the troops from Gaza in preparation for a possible new front in the war. Like I mentioned earlier, Israel has shut its diplomatic missions and embassies in 28 countries around the world. Not just that, the country is in a state of heightened alert. What do you think Israel fears? Let me tell you, Israel fears retaliation, revenge from Iran. You see, last week, suspected Israeli warplanes bombed Iran's embassy in the Syrian capital of Damascus. The strike call uh, killed top Iranian military commander and marked a major escalation in Israel's war with its regional adversaries. How exactly? Israel has struck Iran-linked assets in Syria many times, but this was the first time that Israel carried out an attack on Iran's diplomatic building. In the aftermath, Iran, Iran naturally vowed revenge. Tehran said it reserves the right to take a decisive response and will deliver a slap to Israel. Israel has been on alert since then. It has cancelled home leave for combat troops, called up reserves, bolstered air defenses and today the Israeli defense chief has declared that the country is prepared to handle any Iran scenario. The IDF knows how to deal with Iran offensively and defensively. We are prepared for this. We have good defensive systems and we know how to act forcefully against Iran in both near and distant places. We are operating in cooperation with the United States and strategic partners in the region. The Iran-Israel shadow war has put the U.S. on high alert as well. President Joe Biden reportedly dialed the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, assuring him of America's support. But just hours after the Biden call, became public, Iran issued a warning to the U.S. to stay out of the conflict. In a written message, Tehran warned the U.S. not to get dragged into Netanyahu's trap. Clearly, the regional hostilities have spread and so far Israel was fighting the so-called proxies of Iran in the form of Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis. And now as tensions escalate, is an all-out war between Israel and Iran imminent? And is that why Israel pulled its troops from Gaza, you know, to prepare for another front?